I am Paul Gregory, and this is the Break In Show. Break It yeah. Down Show, excuse Break me. Break It Down Show, that's got right. right. Got it right. <laughs> you did. You did. And if you guys haven't heard about Paul's book, it, it's incredible. Paul, Paul knew the Oswalds. That's just the straight way to say it. He wrote a book called The Oswalds. And when I say he knew them, he knew uh, Lee Harvey and his wife in a way that really nobody else in the nation knew it. Him, his dad himself, he knew them as as friends and and uh, waited a long time, 60 years, to write a book and, and did extensive research. Paul, in his own right, is, is an academic who knows how to do research. So I, I guess the question, and I know you've had, you had to answer this a number of times, but why did you wait? Why did you wait 60 years to write this book? We could take about 30 minutes uh, on that that question. I would say there there's more than one reason for waiting. Um, there was a family reason, and that family reason was that uh, we were not particularly proud once the assassination took place of having known and mm. offered hospitality to the the man who shot the president. Mm. Uh, and, and this was a man with a very questionable background, a, a communist uh, marine deserter. I don't know if he actually would be characterized as a deserter, defecting to the uh, Soviet Union. So clearly, uh, we lived in a community that would not be very uh, impressed or would be quite upset if they learned that the Gregory family had associated with this Oswald guy. Uh, so that's that's really the overriding reason, and I clearly couldn't write that that book while my parents were alive. So that that was a one factor. The other factor is that um, I am a fellow at the Hoover Institution of uh, Stanford, uh, which has some eminent historians who were on yeah. my back once they heard of this aspect of my life they were on my back they say you experienced history and to tell the truth i had not uh, understood that until they um they got on my back and so it's their their argument was you would really be uh, let's say uh stupid is too strong a word but you really need to write this down so that was yeah. another factor um, there may have been other reasons. Those two come to mind right now. Um, oh, the third reason was that I indeed sort of changed in the course of my career from economist to historian. And um, I knew because I'd worked a lot and uh, with um, with Russian archives and Soviet archives, many of them secret, uh, that were purchased by the Hoover Institution archives. And so I'd worked for 20 years in these uh, formerly secret archives. So I consider myself a pretty good researcher. Mm. And uh, if you look at the book, the book does contain a lot of very original research. Yeah. Reading the Warren Report, reading uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, KGB file, et cetera, et cetera. So, I was trying for a good mix of, of uh, historical material that I had dug up, per personal knowledge, sort of anecdotes from being together with Lee and Marina. So those three things uh, convinced me that I had a good book. So I sat down and wrote it. Took a long time to write, by the way. I, I can imagine because there's a lot of um, it's a lot of. There's got to be a lot of Laura Ingalls Wilder experience too. Is like as you put yourself into that environment, that kid who's going to go off to college, the kid who's sitting across from Marina working on language. I mean, all of you, you're like, oh my gosh, that's right. I had that. I wore that white shirt that day, and I know that because she offered me jam and or whatever. And I'm just making things up, but these memories unlock, and that's just one aspect of why this is hard to write. Plus, there's all these different things. One of the things that was fascinating to me about the book was you got to read the real-time interviews of you 
as a young man who um, I would assume you're, you're being as genuine and as helpful as you can be as this tragedy is unfolding and you and your family are squarely in the middle of it. And, and uh, you know, you have a suspect eye on you at, at some point, you know, and, and you're just like, how do I, how do I navigate this? And you, <laughs> you're so young. So when you're reading your own words from the FBI, whether you knew that you were being recorded specifically about certain things or not, what were your thoughts when you read, you know, young Paul's words and reactions being interpreted by uh, a G-man? Uh, well, it, it was quite interesting to read my my own words. Uh, one reason for being interested in re reading my own words was the fact that I wanted to know if my memory was good. And the remarkable thing about reading my own words, reading my father's testimony, uh, um, and, and uh, so on, was uh, the remarkable thing was that my memory was, was quite good. And in general, my memory is not very good. But I think if you think a long time about something, things r return to consciousness that you had long forgotten. So I was quite impressed by the fact that virtually all of my memories turned out to be accurate because if you get into the raw material, the data, uh, I was able to find a, a number of instances where others were present, where others were remembering mm. uh, a particular event. And uh, invariably my memory was, was correct. And in some cases, the difference between what I remember and am confident of and what others saw at the same time and place sometimes can, can be important. I don't know if you recall, you're too young. There's a famous Japanese film called Rashomon, and it was about a rape and murder. It's a Japanese movie from the perspective, for, I think, I think from four different perspectives and each perspective was quite different. Right. And I sort of experienced that. And, and, and an example of this was the uh, dinner party at our house where uh, we introduced or I introduced Lee and Marina to what we call the Dallas Russians, the Dallas Russian community headed by one George Bucha. So if you read the other's testimony of that dinner party, the most important things they left out, either they didn't want to talk about it or, the, or they didn't see it, it was that the dinner party ended with one of the guests, excuse me, Anna Meller, sort of attacking Lee. You know, tell us why you did such stupid things in your life. Why did you leave the Marines? Why did you go to the Soviet Union? I myself escaped from the Soviet Union and it was a terrible place. And Lee became very defensive and he became quite agitated. One of the few times I've seen Lee being agitated because he was being attacked in Russian in front of Marina. So for him, this was a, uh, 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 a, a, a catastrophe. Mm. If you read their testimony, uh, George Bucher and Anna Meller's testimony, they, they didn't even mention this. And this was the whole point of the of, of what came out of this dinner party. So uh, I'm sort of off track here. So you might get me on track again, but I think I, I've answered. Well, yeah, I'll get you on track. So there are there are so many things, and, and you make the reference to the movie in the book, and I'm glad you brought that up. There are all these instances where you are in a moment that actually happens, and whether we know about it in the big historical sense or not, you have the context in between some of these moments. Um, you're looking at the historical references, as you say, academic grade historian surrounded by people like Victor Davis Hanson, who are, you know, worldwide known historians, right? So your your work is is on par with some of the best historians we have. When you read through this and then you see people make leaps, because sometimes historians have to, and you go, oh, oh gosh, that's too big of a leap 
for Lee because you know who Lee was. You know how much he abused his wife. Um, and I want to I want to layer in one piece of context with this too. If you if if this happened today, uh, Marina wouldn't have two rotten teeth. They'd get those things fixed pretty much right away. Uh, you know, she would have access to more of the Russian community, even the Belarusian community. She wouldn't, you know, it would, there'd be more openness. He wouldn't be as uh, self-conscious about his learning disability. He would probably learn how to overcome it. Like this is a very specific point in time where all of these things can turn into this stew. So when you see people analyzing and, and concocting who Lee was, do you see the errors in their judgment based upon the people, the families that you knew, the interactions? Because you're watching him like his brain possibly break at that, you know, at that dinner when it was like, oh, man, you know, he's now going to compartmentalize these people away out of his life and go in a different direction. Uh, well, it's a complicated question, and I have sort of two ways in which I can address it. Let me try the first, and then I'll Please. try to remember the second. The first is if you're basically asking if Lee and Marina were alive, if Lee were alive today, married to Marina, what what would they be like? Uh, my answer is they would be sitting in Minsk, Russia. Uh, Lee would be on a pension which would uh, give them a reasonable uh, uh, lifestyle. Uh, and um, he would be uh, agitated because he's not achieved all the uh, things that he wanted to achieve because he mm. considered himself destined for, for a greatness. So if, if he, the biggest mistake of Lee's life was leaving Mintz because He's not going to have a better life than the life that he had in Minsk. Um, with respect to uh, the second direction I could perhaps go um, is the following, and that is, did people tend to size Lee up incorrectly? And I think that's one of the major contributions of this book, because in order to accept the fact that he was a lone assassin, that is, he shot the president and he did it alone, you you cannot have someone with t total disabilities or a t total inability to accomplish things. In this regard, Lee was a remarkably adept uh, person. Uh, if you look at all that he managed to uh, accomplish, you know, going to Russia, as an 18 or 19 year old, uh, preventing the Politburo, which took up his case, which was a remarkable finding. Um, he defied the Politburo. He, did, uh, he pretended to commit suicide. He was able to convince the Russian authorities to, for him to stay in Russia, despite having thrown his passport on the desk of the consular official at the American embassy. He was able to convince them to let him go home. They even gave him the money to go home. He would badger his uh, his brother and his mother to do certain things for him. He was extremely good at, mani at manipulation. Uh, he uh, was persistent. He didn't give up. And so this is someone, particularly if they feel they're destined for greatness, who has the ability to get things done and without any particular help. Uh, so I think uh, the fact that he had this learning disability, the fact that he couldn't spell, the fact that he didn't know the difference between T-O and T-O-O, all of these things, which have convinced me that he was not terribly adept at doing anything, mm. uh, uh, masked the fact that he was really uh, um, an ideal person to kill a president or a general or a mayor, or if he were alive today, I would say he would be a, a, a school shooter, mm. probably as high as he could aim. So the, his learning disabilities uh, masked the, the features that were perfect for killing a president. Mm. I think I sort of touched upon on your question. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. 
I've been to Dealey Plaza. I've stood in the school, school book depository. You, you can't stand, at least when I was there, you couldn't stand in his uh, nest. But you stand one window over, and it's just not a hard shot. I mean, I, yeah, I'm an army I guy. I to ask you with your military background because I, I in fact, asked this question of Jim Mattis, who's uh, a fellow at Hoover Institution. He said any Marine could have made that shot. And apparently yeah. he did have uh, a marksmanship uh, record. Yeah. Gun. And you absolutely, if you're dealing with the moving target, you're excited. You absolutely could overshoot that first shot. That that target is so close. It's it's imp- And you're shooting through a scope or iron sight. You might overshoot it. Take a deep breath. Bam. Right through the middle. Every, it's well, just there, too close. You know? there, there, is, there is some discussion of why. And... I've tried to avoid getting into the forensics of the assassination. Right. I, I just want to talk about things that I'm capable of talking about. But uh, I am intrigued by the fact that he may have delayed the first shot. And and my interpretation would be he thought it over. Look, I'm about to kill a president. You know, should I really do this? Yeah. And he did it. Uh, so my interpretation of any pause is... No. Am I really going to do this? Am I really yeah. going to do this off? I don't know if you have a, a, a feeling about this. Yeah, it's it's a he's staring at the Rubicon and he's got those rocks in his hand, you know, and is he going to throw? Yeah, you know, he's deciding that, right? Like there's that is a point of no return. You know, he had he knows he got lucky with the general. We can talk about the general in a moment. But yeah, there's there's a moment there. And uh, and then he acts, you know, and so sure maybe a better shot is coming down the street towards him but maybe not maybe there's some circumstance maybe he doesn't want to hurt anybody else and he's like no this is my shot right here and he's already decided and tactically it's so close does it matter and so when it gets there the time gets real Mm -hmm. and he's got plenty of time you know i mean that shot is 70 yards maybe you know and it's yeah he's got time he's got time to think and that in that case and look i you know i can't speak for him but your brain is moving in a way I've been in combat. I've been shot at all that kind of thing. Right. And time moves differently. It flows. It can snap and eight hours can seem like 20 seconds and in 20 seconds can seem like eight hours. Right. And so it's uh, it's an interesting thing to think about when you talk about time and how much time he had, he might have had all day, depending on how he was experiencing it. And we'll never know the answer to that question. But, but from what I know from being in those situations, it, it you just it can be all the time. He might have had all the time in the world sitting there. Mm-hmm. Well, fortunately, so, I've not been in yeah. combat. Fortunately, so uh, yeah. I, I'll listen yeah. to your opinion. So let let's dive back in. When you when you look at this, obviously, when you're doing this, you don't think you're part of this historic event that's playing out over you know, a year, right? You know, you're just interacting with people that you're getting to know. And then you look back and all of a sudden it has all this new context. How did you, how did you deal with that? I mean, you said like there was some family shame, but how did you personally deal with the whole thing of, you know, like, cause, cause there's grief, right? And and there's a long-term grief because this is, is is a historic event. It damages the nation. Some people would say we never recovered from it. So how do you how do you deal with it? Well, I would say I was in shock for more than a year. Uh, I didn't particularly want to talk about it. I limited uh, the number of people I told to very close friends. Um, so I, I the, the best word I can come up with is is shock. It it wasn't shame. Uh, that was more a family thing. Um, I I had strange dreams in which which brought Oswald and Kennedy together with me. And then I would wake I would before waking up I'd say, well, you know, I knew both the assassin and the person assassinated. So I had strange dreams. Um, I met my wife a year later in Germany. Uh, right. Uh, that was in October of 64. 
and and believe it or not, I did not tell her about this until she came to the U.S. before we were married. So that yeah. was, and and after the uh, assassination, I did have a fellowship to study for a year in Berlin. And Berlin, as you know, was uh, uh, at great adulation of Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I made sure I avoided any news people or anything like that who would have, you know, made this a big national story. So I, I just sort of wanted, wanted, wanted it behind me. I would say. Uh, on the other hand, I did realize probably from the first five minutes of of all this that I was a, a witness to to history. Um, so. But the best word is shock, and that shock took a couple of years to resolve itself. We had uh, there's a guy who's a historian. He's, he calls himself the first ladies' man. He he studies all the first ladies, and his name's Andrew Oak. And he was talking about how over I think it was at the Johnson Ranch they were preparing for a, a meal to receive the Kennedys there, and you imagine the shock. They're all you know here comes. Here comes, you know, the Kennedys. We're going to have this barbecue and the reception. There's always people are going to be here. And then, you know, just that kind of shock. Everybody was just floored. Were you at all concerned about being wrapped up into some kind of prosecution or, um, you know, because it's easy to become part of a conspiracy. Oh, You're like, I, you know, I left, I left that out of the, the fourth reason. Uh, for um, writing the book and delaying writing the book. And that is somehow, I think my father understood it from the first moment, um, that we would be prime suspects uh, right. for uh, a conspiracy theory movement. Uh, the reason for this is my father was an oil man. He belonged to Rivercrest Country Club. We belong to Rivercrest Country Club, which is where the oil barons and moguls hung out you know he played golf with them and so it was clear you know if you're looking around for explanations you turn to lbj or i don't i don't really know the argument behind turning to oil interests because whether jfk had a particular oil policy that they liked or disliked i don't know but uh, it was clear that we would uh, be subjects of a, a conspiracy right. and uh contrary to the expectation uh the uh, conspiracy involving us uh really originated in moscow uh, because the politburo once they got word from Dub uh, i think the ambassador may have been dobrinin in washington but they got word immediately that Kennedy had been shot and he'd been shot by a communist. So they, they couldn't tolerate that, the Politburo. So they had to dream something up. And what they dreamed up or what they decided they must do would be to turn Oswald from a left-wing communist into a right-wing fanatic. And so who's gonna turn him into a right-wing fanatic? Well, who's the guy translating for Marina? Pete Gregory. Uh, right. a, a Russian guy. Uh, so this Pete Gregory must have pulled off some kind of trick to convince the world that Oswald was a communist when in reality he was a right winger. Yeah. And, and there was yeah. great controversy over my father's translations for Marina. And interestingly, after the book was written, some anonymous person sent me a tape of my father translating for Marina. Uh, and in that tape, the controversy was her description of the assassination weapon, uh, which the Soviet conspiracy theory said oh, it, it, it can't be Oswald because or for some reason uh, they accused my father of mistranslating Marina's description of the assassination weapon. Uh, and I did listen to it and I didn't hear anything to, to that effect. Uh, there, there was some new information in, in that tape. And it was that 
on the evening after the assassination when my father was translating for her at the Six Flags Inn in the presence of the Secret Service. Um, she was convinced at that point that Lee would not have not have tried to kill Kennedy. He must have been shooting at someone else. Mm -hmm. And but by the next day, I think the evidence had accumulated, and she uh, uh, moved away from that explanation. But I found I found that surprising that she was quite convinced that Oswald must have been shooting at someone else. And one reason I think she was convinced is she had such admiration for Kennedy and for Jackie and the kids uh, that Lee had never objected to because they discussed this in my present presence. Yeah. And she expressed admiration for the Kennedys and Lee said, oh yeah, you know, was sort of nodding. nodding. So I, I did find that, uh, find that interesting. And uh, I also find it interesting that that didn't make it into the Warren report, but um, uh, there are many things that, you know, slightly off, I would say. You mentioned in the book that they had saved someone and, and you know, Marina, we, either way, there is a copy, I think it was of Life with the Kennedys on the cover from a couple of years previous time. that they had brought. Time, time, time. time. yeah. That mm -hmm. they had saved and was prominent, you know, on the copy table, if I remember in the book correctly. Correct. And, and right. so, I mean, this is the impact that that family has. Like, they're showing off that they're like, yeah, we're, you know, we think the Kennedys are it. You know, like we, you know, we're people of our time. And yeah, this would have, uh, I, I did a little bit of research on that. And that issue came out while Lee was in Minsk. Mm. But I did learn. Uh, I guess through Robert uh, Oswald's testimony that Lee had asked him to send certain subscriptions uh, to Minsk, among them being Time Magazine. That's interesting because um, he must have brought, I mean, just think of a family packing to leave the Soviet Union for the U.S. They, they would be very careful about what they brought. They would only bring their most prized possessions with them. Yeah. And given the dating of that, it means Lee brought that with him. So there was some, either either Marina or he, there was some fascination uh, with the Kennedys as evidenced by that uh, Time magazine, which never, never moved while the whole time I was uh, in and out of their, up, uh, their house. Can you in your mind's eye picture that, that magazine on that table? Yes. Still, yes. huh? And wh which cover was it? Do you recall? He, it's a, it, it's not a photograph. It's a caricature. Oh, like uh, a painting? Yeah. And uh, I think it's man of the year. Oh, okay. 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 And I'm not challenging you. I'm just, I'm like, no, I'm no, just like, no, trying I, to I, I put you in the to, moment. I did have to look all these things up and it was as I described it. Well, there are so many of them. It's easy to, you know, like have your brain pick the one and you, you know, it's easy to get it wrong. So I, I appreciate you indulging that. But like when you, you sit there in that room and you see it, like there it is, you know, and it becomes something later on. I, I wanted to go back to your folks for a few minutes because sure. we lose track of time and what life was. So we're talking here, late 50s, early 60s, that era. But your folks come from a completely different planet almost because they're Europeans and what they had to do to come up, to grow up, to survive. You know, and you talk about some of the stories that your dad would tell and they would be so impossibly hard, his upcoming, that you would think, did he make these up even? You know, and so talk a little bit about the nature of your parents and then, and then their love you know, they're immigrants. And so their love for America, their love for people like the Kennedys or the Eisenhowers or whoever it is, because you have a, you have a very idyllic 50s upbringing, according to your, you know, that part of the book where you talk about how you grow up. Yeah. In fact, in writing the book, I, I purposely wanted to sort of set the stage, uh, which was Fort Worth, Texas in 1963 or 62. Um, you know, a uh, very very conservative community, a very patriotic community. Um, but 
uh, the, the sir, I, my father lived two lives. One was a successful petroleum engineer um, who played golf with Ben Hogan at the uh, uh, Rivercrest uh, Country Club. And my right. father remarkably had no accent which is very difficult because he left uh, Russia in uh, 1921 or mm. yeah, 1921 and but he was a um, 18 17 18 year old kid and usually that means you're stuck with an accent for life he had no accent so most most of the business people he worked with had no idea he was from Russia uh, <laughs> and then then we were part of this Russian community uh, Russian emigre community, which was uh, comprised of, uh, of Civil War emigres, uh, uh, like my father, George Bucha. And the other, the more numerous part was the um, displaced person community. Uh, mm. uh, and the, they were like 90%, my father, George Bucha, and um, uh, Golly Clark were first generation. Uh, and uh, if you were a displaced person who had made it, made it out of the Soviet Union uh, and probably you were Ukrainian or Estonian or whatever, this was the typical uh, a member of this Dallas Russian community. And in terms of patriotism, they were super patriots. You know, one could not say anything negative about a president, about the, the country, about the flag, whatever, uh, that would have um, caused a real e eruption. So that was really the, the community in which we, we moved. Um, so, and this community was led by George Bucha. Uh, and for some reason, there, I could not find, I, I could not picture George Bucha, although he and I had been together you know, on numerous occasions. So I, I was desperate to find a photograph of him and uh, did not succeed, even though he endowed a chair at, at Southern Methodist University. Uh, so finally, I found a picture of George Bucha with my parents, which is in, in the book. And I think that's the only extant uh, photograph of George Bucha. Uh, which uh, it's a little oddity aside, but uh, I, I don't know how many weeks I spent trying to find a picture of George Bucher. Mm. And, and it, it is exactly as you would expect, lean, angular. You know, you can see him in the court of uh, Nicholas II uh, as a uh, functionary, which is what his father was. <laughs> I'm glad we took that time out to talk about that because that that takes us over into the Russian community, and you talk extensively about you know how the Russian community looked after the people that made their way into uh, you know, at least that part of Texas, and how once they discover Marina and they detect the problems with the relationship and the way that things are going, they do their best to a point to kind of save her, right? And, and uh, that doesn't work out. There's all these points where if only this had happened, yeah. you know, maybe something would change. But would it or would it have, or would have, would Lee have always, like if we had just calmed down, maybe he's ADD, who knows, you know, like ADHD or whatever. But could they have had a, a solid life? Could he have aged out of this whole thing by just getting a little bit more mature and settling in and then just getting a government job and then four years later, you know, just being a manager and just being too busy with a couple of young kids to get crazy? Well, I'll repeat what I said earlier and then add on to it. His biggest turning point, his biggest mistake was leaving Minsk because that's where – Right. He, he would not have had a better life than Minsk anywhere in this world. Uh, Lee was a um, grass is greener on the other side of the fence guy. Yeah. And if you look at, uh, I did make a calculation that the time he and Marina spent in Fort Worth, and that was the time I was with them the most, was <clears throat> the. <clears throat> the longest amount of time he stayed anywhere except Minsk. So he was a, he was a nomadic, a sort of a vagabond, and, and 
hauling Marina behind him. Uh, I've often thought about this turning point question. You know, did yeah. history change at this moment? You know, but that can drive you crazy because the probability of the two of us talking as we are right now is about one in a hundred trillion. <laughs> so that's the way you need to look at look at yeah. life. Right. Uh, I do. I do believe <clears throat> the dinner at our house, which Lee tried to avoid uh, for reasons he understood quite well, because this would put him and uh, Marina in company of people who are going to speak Russian, and Marina spoke maybe two words of English, and that's going to reveal to her, you know, who he really is. And indeed, when Anna Meller started harassing him almost, and she she was a very mild, um, soft-spoken woman, but she really got on his case. And, mm. and uh, remarkably, I can remember the seating. Uh, we had a big uh, dining room table, and I was um, at the, the right corner, um Lee was next to me then I think Marina was next to him so I could see him uh and you could see him sort of pushing back in his chair his voice rising you know and and Anna attacking him why did you do this we all know Soviet Union is is uh, hell etc cetera, etc cetera. and he said but there's unemployment in the US but you know, there are poor people uh, and there are rich people. And, and uh, you know, he's extremely defensive. Uh, and so this is um, Marina seeing him in a totally new light. Uh, and the worst thing for Lee once the dinner party ended was uh, George Bucha volunteered to drive them home, which was only like 10 minutes from our house. And that meant George Bucha um, knew where they lived. Mm. started appearing uh, with gifts and baby carriages and so on and so forth. So Lee's, obviously that's a real turning point. And I kind of think of it as a handoff from me to them because I was really the only person they associated with at that time. But after the Dallas dinner, then the Dallas Russians started uh, creeping into his life, much to his chagrin. Yeah. It's crazy. Do you recall? Because again, you're just having dinner, and I'm assuming this is a dinner with friends. Like, there's no like, oh boy, this is going to be a dinner. But did you have any sense it would be anything other than that? And then when Anna is interrogating and and you know going after Lee, did that? Do you recall that being uncomfortable? You're like, oh boy, this is getting yes. ugly. Like, what is this dinner like it in was, real life? Very, was, it was very uncomfortable. Uh, and. Yeah. At that point, um, George Bucha said, it's been a very nice evening, it's time to go. Yeah. So he, he wanted to defuse uh, the situation. And he, in fact, he had planned the dinner uh, in such a fashion that uh, as to avoid such confrontations, because you know, he, if you think it over, how he would have looked at it, look, this guy must have a real problem. Uh, right. because of, you know, the, the background and so forth. So I'm going to organize the, 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 the evening such that, you know, I'm going to spend time with Marina. We're going to look at maps of, uh, of Petersburg or Leningrad as she knew it. And uh, Lee was just sort of hanging around. Uh, no one wanted to talk to him. Uh, and uh, so he was just, and Lee always dressed well. You know, that was one of the characteristics of, of Lee that he, he always tried to dress well. He tried to avoid looking like a manual a worker. Uh, so he was he was well dressed. I can almost picture. I think it was tan it was a sports coat. Um, so he was sort of hanging around. Doesn't doesn't know what to do with himself. So he's in another room. He's in what we call the den. I went in. We just sort of sat there, not talking. And then, you know, dinner served. And then. The, the the confrontation with Anna and then George said time to go. 
it's it's wild to think that uh, I mean I don't know how many people are left alive from that dinner, but you and Marina still exist. Have have you ever did you try to reach out for the book? Have you ever since the time when you when you turn and you look and that's the last time you ever see her? Uh, obviously, you can't go see Lee anymore, but have you ever thought to look her up and just to chat and to let? You yeah, know, there, there's healing in that. Maybe I don't know. Well, uh, I I. I... I thought about it, and uh, I talked to her husband, who's a mm. very fine guy. Seems like you know they they live isolated in some rural community outside of Dallas. Um, he's the one who answers the phone. I but there may be occasion where she might answer, but I I spoke to him I guess twice, and he just didn't want people from Marina's past uh, to associate with him and with with her he's very very um set on this so th that was my effort right there and i figured mm. you know if they don't want it i don't want it and then there would have been the problem of uh if we really got into a discussion like this of conflicting memories right. uh, as remember for me this was one of the high points of my life uh or low points let's say yeah, uh, for her, it, you know, just think of the life she's had. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a very minor figure in that life. And so uh, I would have a lot to say. She'd have very little to say. And it, she, she, she might even have forgotten that there was a dinner party. Who knows? Because it's yeah, just right. this, this, uh, a symmetry of, um, of experiences. But yeah. uh, it would have been very interesting. The publisher, uh, did uh, communicate with her, uh, unbeknownst to me, I probably would have advised them not to. And she actually wrote back, you know, this is behind me. I don't really want to uh, uh, get involved in this, which I very much understand. Yeah, I mean, it does it does her no foreseeable good, right? You know, if she's coped with it and if she's lied to herself to cope with it, who cares, right? Like she's the one that had to, bear this stupid cross all these years because of uh, the actions of her husband, you know, and, and he left her with that. Uh, and, and I'm assuming no interaction with any of the kids or anything. You haven't, you haven't maintained any of that. No, I mean, um, I, June, the older, right. Uh, was a baby. And uh, my memory of the, of the, their living conditions was her sleeping in an open suitcase that they'd rigged as a bed. So right. that's my memory of her, uh, and and she was remarkably quiet. So you know, she was at the dinner party on my parents' master bed, and she slept the whole time. So I just remember her as a very quiet, well-behaved baby. So there's you know, and I doubt if she had a lot of interest in meeting with me. Right. So um, right. Um, that 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 describes the the lack of relationship with marina or the kids yeah and the yeah. kids seem to have turned out just fine yeah yeah you know we only have a little bit of time left and there's so many interesting things in the book and i, I don't want to get distracted by the uh conspiracies because that's not really the heart of what makes your book interesting so the first thing i'm going to say is everybody should buy the book and if you're at all interested by the kennedy stuff this is the book to get because there's so many new things to include Paul's recollections and the story. The book is a super easy read. And you know what I always say, buddy read. So buy a copy for you and a friend and read it together. And that way you're helping out Paul. Who's, and really, honestly, like this book was just, it's very interesting. And, you know, it's, it's fun to come up with these elaborate schemes. But when push and shove come together, one finger, one trigger, you know, it, it it's, it makes a lot more sense. And uh, and when you get to know the man, like Paul did, you start to go, well, you know, there's definitely some problems there. So uh, what, when you went through, what was more interesting to you, the the recollections and your experiences and the rediscovery of, of how the government saw you? Or was it some of the other stuff that you were able to pull out of the archives that are now released and unclassified? The, to tell the truth, um, I learned relatively little uh, 
from, let's say, the, the Warren Report, which is a voluminous monster, uh, but done excellently as far as I can see. They really did a good job with it. And so I kind of react when I hear criticism of the Warren Report because I can not conceive of it being done better. Uh, but with respect to things that I witnessed or I knew of, I really didn't find any uh, big lapses in memory. So, uh, and that's one of the one of the most important things that I was after in doing yeah. research. I was quite fascinated by the KGB file of Oswald because I've been working with such files and could pretty much, I'd be one of the ideal persons to authenticate this as well. And it, it was authentic. And it does, as I say, can, the file is, is consists of two parts. One part is Lee is a youngster in in uh, Minsk, in Moscow. And the second part is the assassination. Um, and in both cases, and as I said, I was surprised that his case as this uh, rather odd teenage tourist in Moscow that his case was dealt with by the Politburo. Very few things get to the Politburo. So that, although, you know, my first inclination is the guy shows up, he's dealt with by in tourists and the, they decide he should leave. That's, I thought it was sort of a local issue, but it turns out, you know, there was serious discussion at the Politburo level. So I would say that was the thing that interested me the most, but it could be because of my professional interests. Um, coincided with this. Mm -hmm. And do you think because there was a Cuban Missile Crisis and that that was such a dangerous time, do you think that his presence caused uh, more attention at all? I mean, that that we had Calder Walton on the show the other day. He's a historian from Harvard and he wrote a book called Spies and it looks in the East and the West. And when he looks at all of the pieces and puts it all together, because everybody's playing their individual part, He's like, man, we we came so close. We got lucky. The timing worked out the way yes. it did. The Cuban Missile Crisis had a great impact on me. I doubt if it had much of an impact on Lee, because you know those of us who lived through it. I was a college student. Right. I remember wondering, am I going to wake up the next day? And right. indeed, it came that that close. So you know, it it was a very significant event for me, but it had very little to do with the with the assassination. Um, I would say the, the most important thing to, to note about the assassination theories is they, it seems to rest on the, on this Cuba, on this Mexico city trip. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, it, I think the conspiracy theorists, theorists do not understand what Lee was up to. He was mm -hmm. up to, a, a, a life in Cuba with Marina. And in order to get that life in uh, in Cuba, he needed to get both a Soviet visa and a Cuban visa. And it turns out, if you look at the details, it's very difficult to do this. And right. so that's the reason he was in Mexico City. He was there to get a visa. If the visa had come through, they would have gone there and been no assassination. Um, so uh there a lot has been made of the fact that the consular official with whom he telephoned which was intercepted and that's a, a side comment on on uh classification because surely everybody knew that the u.s um uh intelligence community was eavesdropping on telephone calls to the right and so but they they kept that in the top secret files forever and ever just to confirm what everybody already knew. So I'm a critic of overclassification. Yeah, uh, me too. Me too. I was a kind of uh, but I think it's uh, because it does seem to boil down to that uh, trip to Mexico City, and it's a either conscious or unconscious um, misapplication of what he was up to. He was, he, as I said, he's a green grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Right. U.S. didn't work. Russia didn't work. Cuba's going to work. I'm going to have an, a, a perfect life there. That that was him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess uh, 
Let me ask this question, try it in a different way. I'm less worried about the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, impacting him directly, but did how Russia treat him, and maybe the timing doesn't work out, but, but he, no. I, was he there? Like, was, was there, because they want an asset, they want people to deal with, but also is he just like, oh, this guy's a problem, let's get him out of here. Is how was their treatment different to him, or or was the was he already on his way back when the crisis happened? Well, well it was that October sixty two? October sixty two, yeah. Uh, he came in June of sixty. Oh, so he's already back. Okay, okay. Yeah, and he's a, a welder. Uh, right. Who knows whether he even read the news? Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, I would ha really have no nothing to add about that. Okay. Yeah. No. No. I just didn't. The timing thing. I wasn't sure like if that had impacted their treatment of him um yeah what a what an odd case you uh you talk about this letter that you get and i think this is another fascinating thing and i don't know how much you you know think if i would have uh paid more attention or if i would have written a different response but talk a little bit about this letter that you get when you're at school and how you respond and and the what impact you think it might have had uh i i consider that letter extremely important um, i can't get any, anyone else to consider it as important as i think it was because right. it was really uh, an unveiling of the true lee to marina uh, and it happened in this way i uh, i go back to norman oklahoma for school lee and marina courtesy of the dallas russians moved to dallas so i think around November 20th or so, right before Thanksgiving of 62, I get a postcard it says, Dear Paul, um, we've moved to Dallas. Here's our address. I have a good job and, we, and a nice apartment. Come visit. And so I, re I read it in their grammatical errors. And I, at the time, I was not aware that Lee had these learning disabilities. And so I figured with all these misspellings, uh, it must be Marina trying to learn English. And so I wrote a long letter to to her because I thought she wrote the postcard uh, that, uh, you know, you, you, it's T-O, not T-O-O, -O, and you're supposed to use punctuation because Lee never used punctuation. And um, on Thanksgiving Day, get a phone call I'm in Fort Worth there in Fort Worth visiting Robert for Thanksgiving dinner. Now come, I, I'd like you to come get get us and take us to the bus station. But that those weren't her first words. Her first words were, Lee wrote the letter, not I. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you can imagine how, how, and they kept every letter they ever got um because all these all of his all of his correspondence is in the warren report that letter is not there so the minute he got it he must have burned it but by that time the damage had been done so i go and pick him up at robert's house going to take him to the bus station and we had a very very restrained uh sober uh two hours in our mm. house uh and marina by this time, Marina was quite open about mistreatment. So she was telling all these bad things about Lee and Lee was sitting there, his shoulders slumped, you know, sort of as if each word were a body blow to, to yeah. him. So that letter, for sure, you know, she held that over him, I'm sure. Uh, he, he was, um, uh, she, she, it, it, it would, not be possible to read that letter for her to read that letter without her understanding that lee was sort of a fraud because lee had told her they were going to live off his royalties from his, his historic di diary right uh, so uh, anyway uh that yeah. letter was very important that, yeah it sounds like it i mean it is is there a world where he saves that marriage or does he think that it's time for action? And I've already faked my uh, suicide once I got to get bigger. And, you know, obviously, you know, he shoots at the general. So he's ramping up his, uh, his importance in terms of history and where he's going. But is there any way that he ever, cause he, 
he has to beg, borrow, and plead just to get her to go to Thanksgiving, right? Correct. Um, I, I think it was a true marriage of love. It's a very strange love story because she, once they moved to Dallas, she had all kinds of friends, Russian-speaking friends, with whom she could seek refuge, uh, one being Ruth Payne, who was studying Russian, uh, where she was quite welcome and right. enjoyed living. Uh, so, uh, but the fact that she could exit the marriage if she wanted through her friends uh, gave her all kinds of opportunities to, to cut it off. But each time she would let him know where she was, she would give the telephone number where she was, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and yeah, my father was with her when um, he had to inform her that Lee was dead. Um, and she, she insisted on going to Parkland to see the body. And uh, once they were in the uh, uh, morgue, uh, she performed sort of a Russian type ritual you know, with the body. So I think it was a, a very strange love story to tell the truth. Do we but have a couple minutes? Who, who, yeah. who am I to, to uh, judge such things as a as a twenty one year old kid? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially, yeah, when you're, yeah, who who knows? Uh, do we can we really briefly cover Marguerite's bayonet that chapter because that's also fascinating. If you if you got to know Marguerite, you would you would know Lee. You would know Lee um, because. They were identical, and I think it is very interesting that Lee hated his mother so much. He, and I think the reason he hated her so much is that she was he, and he was she. Um, you know, she um, felt that life had mistreated her; that every every job she had, there was someone who was against her. She was destined for greatness, uh, but it was they kept her from being great. She was always wanting to sue people um, uh, and so on. She was a, 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 incredibly irritating. Um, so she and Marina, my father, two Secret Service agents, uh, hold out in Six Flags Inn with the kids and Marina and Marguerite, the mother. Uh, and my father spent the whole day there. He would leave in late in the evening and return in the morning. They stayed at the Six Flags Inn. And Marguerite got, Marguerite's behavior got more and more bizarre as mm -hmm. time passed. And uh, almost immediately, um, I, and I think Lee was, that was after Lee was shot and dead. She said, well, I demand he be buried in Arlington National Cemetery because um, he's actually a, a secret agent for the government. So he died in the line of duty. Uh, then she would, um, once they were at Six Flags Inn, uh, she would um, uh, go to the center of the room and say, I have, an, an, I have a, uh, an announcement to make. And so she would make some kind of odd announcement. So she was... Either she was crazy beforehand or she, she the, the event drove her crazy. But she immediately started thinking about money because envelopes started coming in with money for Marina, but not for her. So she was mm. extremely uh, um, angry and uh, jealous of Marina, that Marina was getting the money she was not. Uh, and it got to the point where it was sort of an untenable situation with her, Marina, the girl, and the kids all together. Right. And the Marina and Marguerite slept in the same room. And for some reason, Marina went through her uh, Marguerite's belongings and found a found a bayonet. They confronted Mar uh, Marguerite the next morning, and she said, "Well, uh, women." must have means of, de of defending themselves. So that was her, I don't know if she always carried around a bayonet, but it sort of shows, shows who she was. Yeah. 
And then, this, then by the way, they then segregated Marguerite uh, from Marina and the, and the kids because she could have posed a real danger with the bayonet. And uh, then they both went back. Uh, uh, Marina went to Dallas to live in the home of, that's a long story, someone. They took her back to Fort Worth and uh, where she decided that the secret agent, the secret service agents were out to kill her. So mm -hmm. if when she went to testify before the war commission, um, she called the local newspaper for a reporter to go with them to prevent the secret agent from assassinating her on the way. So the, she was totally bonkers and she bothered our family for, I think about a year mm -hmm. telephone calls. Just real briefly, uh, this moment obviously changed anybody from your generation, your time. It changed your guys' lives. You happen to look on TV and go, holy, I know that dude. I mean, that obviously changes your life. He says these words, I'm a patsy. Yeah. And that creates like this, what? And then he's dead. If he survives, is this worse for you? Or is it better that he dies? Have you ever thought about that? Like if he survives? Uh, and he's I thought uh, when I saw Ruby and I saw it on live TV, Ruby shooting uh, Oswald. Yeah. I said, we're not going to ever know the truth. Yeah. And that was my, my reaction. I don't know if others reacted in that way or not, but um, clearly Lee was looking forward to this trial. You know, he, he, according to Marina's te uh, uh, testimony, when she saw him for the last time in the jail, he was he was very a frightened kid. But you know, this was his life's work, and he had pulled it off. And he was going to testify and you know talk about Marx and surplus value and uh, the proletariat, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, he it, th this was his life's achievement. And, you know, this, what I thought a lot about was the killing of Trippett because mm. Trippett was a, you know, ordinary guy, earned a living, had kids, you know, and so that, that really spoiled Lee's, Lee's narrative that, right. um, uh, you know, so he, he, he clearly Lee panicked uh, because what he did was not very smart, you know, getting a bus, getting off the bus, going home, getting the pistol, getting out, getting in a cab. Probably the first time he was ever in a cab because he walked or used the bus. So, um, but going back to your question, my, my, my thought was we're, we're not going to know the truth and this is going to yeah. be a big mess. And so in that sense, I was quite prophetic. But was your life, was your burden lessened by that? No, no, okay. uh, no. I, I think you know it was clear that it was clear this is going to go. Yeah, we would, not, we would not get the answers easily that we really needed to get <clears throat> because uh, you no know, Ruby's Ruby is a problem. You know, uh, you you have to figure out you know. Two two weird guys doing weird things, um, and then you have to explain his behavior, her, uh, uh, Lee's behavior, et cetera. So it, right, I, I, I said it's going to be a mess. Yeah, and not 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 only will we never know the truth, we'll never believe the truth. Now, there there is no truth anymore. Well, the what the one thing I got out of writing this was that um i started thinking it over and and it it was our loss of national innocence because as far as i was concerned the warren commission was a you know blue ribbon panel the top people in the u.s all with very excellent reputations and the fact that the american public would not accept their judgment uh meant a loss of innocence since then you know whenever there is a uh you know, commission report. There's, it's always met with skepticism. You know, somebody's lying. It's based on yeah. lies, etc. Uh, and I think it, a notable national event was the re, the public rejection of the Warren report. Yeah, yeah.
Well, listen, I've had you for just a little bit over an hour, but I appreciate it. It's been great. The book, the book is fantastic. Like 15, felt like 15 minutes. That's what I want, man. That's what I want. It's great. And, uh, and he, I hope we can talk again about something that I, you and I both know a little bit about. Yeah. And it, it's just been, it's been incredible. I really, any, any closing thoughts before we wrap it up? No. Um, I'd say I, no, I'm glad I I'm glad I wrote the book. Uh, yeah, me too. I, one, the fifth reason for delaying is it's the loss of privacy. Um, you know, I, it's made me something of a public figure where I don't want to be a public figure. If it, if I if it were Nobel Prize, I'd be very happy. But knowing Oswald, it's not that big an achievement. So yeah. a loss of privacy, I would say. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Everybody really should go check it out. If if the Kennedy assassination is at all interesting to you, you have to have this book in your collection. It's really fantastic. Stand by for one sec, Paul. I'll be right back to you, and I'll say goodbye proper. Okay. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here, are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank